students and families. I'm so happy to share a read aloud with you today. Today, we are going to read the story, The Other Side, written by Jacqueline Woodson, illustrated by E.B. Lewis. This week, third graders are learning about author's message. During the read aloud today, we're going to stop and talk about the author's message during the story. We're going to think about what kind of message is the author trying to share with us. Then, after you listen to the story, we will ask you some questions to think about and talk about with somebody at home. Then, you'll see a few writing prompts presented. We're going to ask you to choose one reading prompt and answer it. You can even share your writing with your teacher. Finally, we'll give you a few ideas for how to extend and enrich your learning and have some fun. I hope you enjoy The Other Side by Jacqueline Woodson. Enjoy! Today, I'm going to read a historical fiction text called The Other Side, written by Jacqueline Woodson, illustrations by E.B. Lewis, with permission to read from Penguin Random House in partnership with Nancy Paulson Books. When I read a historical fiction text, I get my brain ready to think about how the setting, including the location and the time period, affects the story's plot. This can also help me to better understand the characters. In today's text, we will be reading a story about a time when children of different races were not allowed to play together. But one summer, two girls, Clover and Annie, show that change can be made even if from two girls and their friendship. You have been learning about theme or the author's message. The theme of this story is change can happen little by little, one child at a time. As I read today, I want you to consider what the author and illustrator are showing us about the theme through their words and pictures. I will be monitoring my understanding of the text as I'm reading and will pause at different points to think aloud. Enjoy the other side. That summer, the fence that stretched through our town seemed bigger. We lived in a yellow house on one side of it. White people lived on the other, and Mama said, don't climb over that fence when you play. She said it wasn't safe. That summer, there was a girl who wore a pink sweater. Each morning, she climbed up on the fence and stared over at our side. Sometimes I stared back. She never sat on that fence with anybody. That girl didn't. Once, when we were jumping rope, she asked if she could play, and my friend Sandra said no without even asking the rest of us. I don't know what I would have said. Maybe yes, maybe no. That summer, everyone and everything on the other side of that fence seemed far away. When I asked Mama why, she said, because that's the way things have always been. Sometimes when me and Mama went into town, I saw that girl with her Mama. She looked sad sometimes, that girl did. Don't stare, my Mama said. It's not polite. I'm going to pause here and monitor what it is that I've been reading. I'm noticing that the white girl seems very lonely. The narrator and her friends wouldn't let her jump rope with them and she doesn't seem to have any other friends. It also says in the text that the girl looked sad. I'm going to go ahead and keep reading to find out what happens next. It rained a lot that summer. On rainy days, that girl sat on the fence in a raincoat. She let herself get all wet and acted like she didn't even care. Sometimes I saw her dancing around in puddles, splashing and laughing. Mama wouldn't let me go out in the rain. 
That's why I bought you rainy day toys, my mama said. You stay inside here, where it's warm and safe and dry. But every time it rained, I looked for that girl. And I always found her somewhere near the fence. Some place in the middle of the summer, the rain stopped. When I walked outside, the grass was damp and the sun was already high up in the sky, and I stood there with my hands up in the air. I felt brave that day. I felt free. I got close to the fence and that girl asked me my name. Clover, I said. My name's Annie, she said. Annie Paul. I live over yonder, she said, by where you see the laundry. That's my blouse hanging on the line. She smiled then. She had a pretty smile. And then I smiled, and we stood there looking at each other, smiling. It's nice up on this fence, Annie said. You can see all over. I ran my hand along the fence. I reached up and touched the top of it. A fence like this was made for sitting on, Annie said. She looked at me sideways. As I've been reading, I noticed Clover took an interest in Annie. She looked for her on rainy days, and now she's talking to Annie. I wonder if Clover is worried about hanging out with Annie. Her friends and her mama might not like it, but I also know that Clover is interested. Let's go ahead and read to see how their friendship develops. My mama says I shouldn't go on the other side, I said. My mama says the same thing, but she never said nothing about sitting on it. Neither did mine, I said. That summer, me and Annie sat together on that fence, and when Sandra and them looked at me funny, I just made believe I didn't care. Some mornings, my mama watched us. I waited for her to tell me to get down from that fence before I break my neck or something. But she never did. I see you made a new friend, she said one morning. And I nodded and Mama smiled. That summer, me and Annie sat on that fence and watched the whole wide world around us. I think that Mama actually likes the friendship that Clover and Annie have. One day, Sandra and them were jumping rope near the fence and we asked if we could play. I don't care, Sandra said. And then we jumped. Sandra and me were partners the way we used to be. It seems that Clover and Annie's friendship has changed the way the other girls think too. I see them all sitting together on the top of the fence. It says, when we were too tired to jump anymore, we sat up on the fence, all of us in a long line. So I'm thinking that because of Clover and Annie, everyone is beginning to have a different perspective about children of different races playing together. Someday, somebody's going to come along and knock this old fence down, Annie said. And I nodded. Yeah, I said. Someday. Before I started reading this story, I told you that the theme, or the author's message, was that change can happen little by little, one child at a time. Think about what we were reading in this story. How did Clover and Annie's friendship make change? I hope you enjoyed The Other Side. Now that you've listened to the story, The Other Side, let's talk about it. Why do you think Annie is sad in the beginning of the book? How do you think Clover feels about Annie looking lonely? Why do you think the girls begin talking to each other and start a friendship? Why do you think Clover's mother 
didn't tell her to get off the fence that first day. If the theme or author's message for this story is, change can happen little by little, one child at a time. Which illustration or detail from the text best supports this message? Now it's your turn to write. Explain the importance of the fence in the story. Think about how the children use the fence to push the boundaries of that time period. Name some boundaries you are not allowed to cross. Maybe it's a busy street, a corner of the sidewalk, or even an older brother or a sister's room. What are the reasons people create boundaries? Connect your example of a boundary with an example from the text, The Other Side. Enrichment. Have fun. E.B. Lewis uses watercolors to create beautiful pictures for the story. Use watercolors or any other art supplies to create an outdoor picture of trees, flowers, and sky. Add the ground and a fence too. If you're feeling brave, Try adding people in your piece of art. Annie and Clover made friends with each other. Think about the friendships you have. Write a letter, text, or email to a friend. Tell them what you miss about their friendship. Talk about what you two can do together once you can see each other again. The characters in the story are playing outside on the sunny days. On the next sunny day, go outside and swing, jump rope, draw with chalk, or ride a scooter, skateboard, or bike. Get some physical activity and have fun. I hope you've enjoyed this read aloud today, and I can't wait to see you next time. Bye-bye. Hello, BCPS students and families. We are happy to share the read aloud Flossie and the Fox with you today. Flossie and the Fox is a revision of a traditional fairy tale, Little Red Riding Hood. Today, we will review how to read and understand fiction text, which is a little different than what you've done for the last week or so. During the read aloud today, we will stop and talk about how this story is different from the traditional tale of Little Red Riding Hood. Flossie is a much different character than Little Red Riding Hood was. Listen to see how the author, Patricia McKissick, develops Flossie into a strong, confident character. After you listen to the story, we'll ask you some questions to think about and even talk with someone at home. Then you'll see a few writing prompts presented. You can choose one or two of those prompts to write about. You can even share your writing with your teacher. Finally, we will give you a few ideas for how to extend and enrich your learning and have some fun. I hope you enjoyed listening to Flossie and the Fox by Patricia McKissick. Hello, BCPS students and families. Welcome to another Read Aloud this week. Today, I will be reading the story Flossie and the Fox, written by Patricia C. McKissick. 
illustrated by Rachel Isadora. Thank you to Dial Books for Young Readers, a division of Penguin Publishing, for granting permission for us to bring you this read aloud today. Today, as I'm reading, I'm going to stop and we're going to think about how the author is developing the characters in the story. Flossie and the Fox is a revision story of an original tale, Little Red Riding Hood. I bet you know the story of Little Red Riding Hood. I want you to think about that story today. And I want you to think about Little Red Riding Hood herself. As I'm reading, think about how Flossie is very different from Little Red Riding Hood. Are you ready to get started? Me too. Here we go. Flossie! The sound of Big Mama's voice floated past the cabins in Sophie's quarters, round the smokehouse, beyond the chicken coop, all the way down to Flossie Finley. Flossie tucked away her straw doll in a hollow log, then hurried to answer her grandmother's call. Here I am, Big Mama, Flossie said after catching her breath. It was hot, hotter than a usual Tennessee August day. Big Mama stopped sorting peaches and wiped her hands and face with her apron. Take these to Miss Viola over at the McCutcheon's place, she said, reaching behind her and handing Flossie a basket of fresh eggs. Seem like they've been troubled by a fox. Miss Viola's chickens be so scared they can't even now lay a stone. Big Mama clicked her teeth and shook her head. Why come Mr. J.W. can't catch the fox with his dogs? Flossie asked, putting a peach in her apron pocket to eat later. Every time they corner that old slickster, he gets away. I'll tell you, the fox is one sly critter. How do a fox look? Flossie asked. I disremember ever seeing one. Big Mama had to think a bit. Chili, a fox be just a fox. But one thing for sure, that rascal loves eggs. He'll do most anything to get at some eggs. Flossie tucked the basket under her arm and started on her way. Don't tarry now, Big Mama called. And be particular about them eggs. Yes, um, Flossie answered. The way through the woods was shorter and cooler than the road route under the open sun. Hmm, what if I come upon a fox? thought Flossie. Oh, well, a fox be just a fox. That ain't so scary. Flossie commenced to skip along. When she came upon a critter she couldn't recollect ever seeing. He was sitting inside the road like he was expecting somebody. Flossie skipped right up to him and nodded a greeting the way she had been taught to do. Top of the morning to you, little missy, the critter replied. And what is your name? I be Flossie Finley, she answered with a proper curtsy. I reckon I don't know who you be either. Slowly, the animal circled around Flossie. I am a fox, he announced, all the time eyeing the basket of eggs. He stopped in front of Flossie, smiled as best a fox can, and bowed. At your service. Flossie rocked back on her heels, then up on her toes, back and forth back and forth, carefully studying the creature who was claiming to be a fox. Nope, she said at last. I just purely don't believe it. You don't believe what? Fox asked, looking away from the basket of eggs for the first time. I don't believe you a fox, that's what. Fox's eyes flashed anger. 
Then he chuckled softly. <laughs> My dear child, he said, sounding right disgusted. Of course I'm a fox. A little girl like you should be simply terrified of me. Whatever do they teach children these days? Flossie tossed her head in the air. Well, whatever you are, you show sure think a heap of yourself, she said and skipped away. I'm going to stop here. It seems that Flossie is not really frightened by this fox at all. I'm sort of wondering, now that she sees this creature, does she recognize this is a fox? Or is she truly not still remembering? Hmm. I'm not really sure. I need to keep reading and find out. Let's continue. Fox looked shocked. Wait, he called. You mean you're not frightened? Not just a bit? Flossie stopped. Then she turned and said, I ain't never seen a fox before, so why should I be scared of you? And I don't even now know you a real fox for a fact. Fox pulled himself tall. He cleared his throat. <clears> throat> Are you saying I must offer proof that I am a fox before you will be frightened of me? That's just what I'm saying. Little Flossie skipped on through the piney woods while that fox fella rushed away looking for whatever he needed to prove he was really who he said he was. Meanwhile, Flossie stopped to rest beside a tree. Suddenly, Fox was beside her. I have the proof, he said. See, I have thick, luxurious fur. Feel for yourself. Fox leaned over for Flossie to rub his back. Hmm, feels like rabbit fur to me, she said to Fox. Shucks, you ain't no fox. You a rabbit, all the time trying to fool me. Me? A rabbit? He shouted. I have you know my reputation precedes me. I am the third generation of foxes who have outsmarted and outrun Mr. J. W. McCutcheonson's fine hunting dogs. I have raided some of the best hen houses from Franklin to Madison. Rabbit indeed! I am a fox and you will act accordingly. Flossie hopped to her feet. She put her free hand on her hip and patted her foot. Unless you can show me you a fox, I'll not accord you nothing. And without further ceremony, she skipped away. I'm going to stop here again. Oh my goodness, Flossie does not seem frightened at all. She's so calm and collected. She even pets the fox's fur. She's not bothered that Fox is very upset with her. I'm still wondering, does Flossie really know this is a Fox or not? I'm wondering if maybe she's tricking him. I'm going to have to keep reading to find out. Down the road a piece, Flossie stopped by a bubbling spring. She knelt to get a drink of water. Fox came up to her and said, I have a long pointed nose. Now that should be proof enough. Don't prove a thing to me. Flossie picked some wild flowers. Come to think of it, she said matter of fact like, rats got long pointed noses. She snapped her fingers. That's it. You a rat trying to pass yourself off as a fox. That near bout took Fox's breath away. I beg your pardon, he gasped. You can beg all you wanna, Flossie said, skipping on down the road. That still don't make you no fox. I'll teach you a thing or two, young lady, Fox called after her. You just wait and see. 
Before long, Flossie came to a clearing. A large orange tabby was sunning on a tree stump. Hi, pretty kitty, the girls say and rub the cat behind her ears. Meanwhile, Fox slipped from behind a clump of bushes. Since you won't believe me when I tell you I'm a fox, he said stiffly, perhaps you will believe that fine feline creature toward whom you seem to have some measure of respect. Flossie looked at the cat and winked her eye. He shall use a heap of words, she whispered. Fox beckoned for Cat to speak up. Cat jumped to a nearby log and yawned and stretched. Then she answered, This is a fox because he has sharp claws and yellow eyes, she purred. Fox seemed satisfied, but Flossie looked at Cat. She looked at Fox. Then once more at both, just to be sure. She say, I'll do respect, Miss Cats, but both of y'all have sharp claws and yellow eyes, so that don't prove nothing. Captain, both y'all be cats. Fox went to howling and running round in circles. He was plumb beside himself. I am a fox, and I know it he shouted. This is absurd. No call for you to use that kind of language, Flossie said, and she skipped away. I'm going to stop here again. I am so surprised at how angry Fox is getting. Flossie doesn't seem to be bothered by his anger and his frustration at all. She just keeps referring to him as a different animal, even though he's getting more and more upset, and she continues to walk her path to end up at Ms. Viola's house. I'm thinking back to the traditional story of Little Red Riding Hood. I know that Little Red Riding Hood, she was very frightened of the wolf of that story, and Flossie is not at all frightened by the fox of this story. I can definitely see how Patricia McKissick, the author, is developing Flossie into a stronger character than maybe Little Red Riding Hood was. We have to keep reading to see if we can continue develop, to develop what kind of character Flossie is. Let's keep going. Wait, wait! Fox followed, pleading. I just remembered something. It may be the solution to this, this horrible situation. Good. It's about time. I, I, I have a bushy tail. Fox seemed to perk up. That's right, he said. All foxes are known for their fluffy, bushy tails. That has got to be adequate proof. Ain't gotta be. You got a bushy tail. So do squirrels. Flossie pointed to one overhead leaping from branch to branch in the treetops. Here, have a bite of peach, she said, offering Fox first bite of her treat. But Fox was crying like a natural-born baby. No, 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 he sobbed. If I promise you I'm a fox, won't that do? Flossie shook her head no. Oh, woe is me, Fox hollered. I may never recover my confidence. Flossie didn't stop walking. That's just what I've been saying. You just an old old confidencer. Come telling me you was a fox, then can't prove it? Shame on you. Long about that time, Flossie and the fox came out of the woods. Flossie cupped her hands over her eyes and caught sight of McCutcheon's quarters and Miss Viola's cabin. 
fox didn't notice a thing. He just followed behind Flossie, begging to be believed. Give me one last chance, he pleaded. Flossie turned on her heels. Okay, but just this once more. Fox tried not to whimper, but his voice was real unsteady-like. I, I have sharp teeth and I can run exceedingly fast. He waited for Flossie to say something. Slowly, the girl rocked from heel to toe, back and forth. You know, she finally said, smiling, it don't make much difference what I think anymore. What? Fox asked, why? Because there's one of Mr. J.W. McCutcheon's hound behind you. He's got sharp teeth and can run fast too. And by the way that hound's looking, it's all over for you. Oh, I'm gonna stop here again. Flossie doesn't seem surprised at all that these dogs are looking and staring at Fox. It's as if she was expecting Fox to get chased by the McCutcheon's hounds. This is making me sort of think that she was tricking Fox the whole time. She was trying to keep him maybe distracted while she was walking to the McCutcheon's house. Huh, she seems pretty clever. Let's finish the story and see if we're right. With a quick glance back, Fox dashed toward the woods. The hound knows who I am, he shouted. But I'm not worried. I sure can outsmart and outrun one of Mr. J.W. McCutcheonson's miserable mutts any old time of the day, because, like I told you, I am a fox. I know, said Flossie. I know. She turned toward Ms. Viola's with the basket of eggs safely tucked under her arm. Oh my goodness, look at that great big smile on Flossie's face. Oh, she definitely knew he was a fox the whole time. She was tricking the fox. Flossie outsmarted the fox. Remember in the beginning when her grandmother was telling her to be careful of the sly fox? I think that Flossie outsmarted the fox so she could get to Ms. Viola's and deliver the fresh eggs without any trouble. Oh man, I really love this story. Flossie and the Fox was a fabulous re revision of Little Red Riding Hood. I think Flossie was a smart, clever girl who never got outwitted and outsmarted by that fox. I hope you enjoyed Flossie and the Fox as much as I did. I hope you have a wonderful rest of your week. Please stay safe, stay healthy, and we can't wait to see you soon. Bye-bye. Now that you've listened to the story, let's talk about it. Flossie and the Fox uses authentic dialect from the rural South, and Flossie herself even makes up her own words. How do the words and language in this text add to your overall enjoyment of the story? Explain the phrase, a fox be just a fox. What does Big Mama and Flossie mean by saying this? How does the illustration on the last page 
help explain Flossie's words and actions throughout the story. Now it's your turn to write about it. Do you think Flossie knew the fox was a fox during the whole story? Explain why you think she did or didn't know. Be sure to include a detail from both the beginning and end of the story. Flossie and the fox was told by a narrator. How would the story have been different if Flossie told the story directly from her point of view. Write one or two more pages to the story, Flossie and the Fox. Include what you think could have happened once the McCutcheonson's hounds chased Fox away. Now it's time to have some fun. You can choose from any of the following activities. Use some old socks, paper bags, or other materials to make two puppets. One puppet for Flossie and the other for Fox. Put on a puppet show for someone to retell the story of Flossie and the Fox. Flossie and the Fox was a story that Patricia McKissett's grandfather told her when she was young. Ask someone older than you to tell you a story about a time before you were born. Try to even write that story down so you can remember it years from now. Use plastic eggs, rocks, or something else you have at home to represent the eggs in Flossie's basket. Play games with them like going on an egg hunt, egg relay, or hot egg potato. We hope you enjoyed listening to today's Read Aloud, Flossie and the Fox, and have a wonderful rest of your day. Bye-bye.